Now on BBC Radio 4, poet and comedian Tim Key explores the strange sounds that became the Soviet soundtrack to the space race. In November 2004, I went to dinner at my friends Scott and Peggy's flat in London, UK. It was a warm, friendly affair, nicely put together but not flashy or up itself. It involved Scott making something using peppers and oil, and Peggy occasionally trying to get me to mix with the other guests. It was a solid evening, no more than that, until about 10.30pm. At 10.30pm, everything changed beyond belief. One second. Lovely. At 10.30pm, Peggy announced she had something for me. Scott had already wowed me with a 2003 Hock and a couple of cans of Hofmeister he'd laid down, and now here was Peggy scuttling into a cupboard and coming back with a gift for me. This music is ridiculous. I think you'll love it, Tim, she said, and I felt it was an ungracious thing to say whilst gifting a CD, but a gift's a gift, so I took it, and I ate the peppers, and I drank the oil, and I cycled home. This music is ridiculous. I think you'll love it, Tim. I think you'll love it, Tim. I think you'll love it, Tim. What did it mean? What did she mean? I threw off my jacket, I marched to my desk, I plunged the CD into my player, and I pressed play. How is it ridiculous? And if it's ridiculous, why would I like it? I like ridiculous things, do I? My taste is ridiculous, is it? I'm a ridiculous boy, am I? I see. There we go. And the music played. The music of Vacheslav Mascherin and his orchestra played. And I loved it. It was, as advertised, nuts, totally bananas. Utterly divvy, stupid, frankly, ridiculous. I kicked off my trainers and made myself some cheese and listened to the whole album, and I loved it. I loved it. Loved, loved this music. It raced through my blood like Hofmeister. I loved it, but what was it? And how could I get my hands on more? This is a radio documentary about that CD. The one that Peggy gave me. Easy USSR. Volume 2. This is track 15. After the rain. Vacheslav Mascherin's Easy OSSR Volume 2 floors me every time I listen to it. But that's where it ends. I've only got the one CD. Yeah, two if you count Easy OSSR Volume 1, but... And amongst my problems are that... A. Vacheslav Mascherin's Wikipedia page is wafer thin. And B. Vacheslav Mascherin himself is not only grey and difficult to pin down, he's also dead. Aside from that, I really only have sleeve notes. You might ask why I would make a Radio 4 documentary about this CD. The truth is, if I want to find out more, I more or less have to make a Radio 4 documentary about it. For a start, when you make a Radio 4 documentary, you get to have a producer. And my one is smart. She's a terrier, in fact. And she has tracked down the man who wrote the sleeve notes. Hearing Michelin's music uh, was inevitable in the Soviet Union in the 60s and the early 70s. A Russian journalist, Archon Troitsky, giving context. The ensemble of electronic musical instruments led by Vyacheslav Mishirin. This ensemble belonged to Russian state radio and TV. I mean, they were staff members, just like uh, the folk balalaika orchestras, like a symphony orchestra, and so they have uh, filled the niche for trendy music. In the second half of the 50s, there's been a big fashion in the USA, the so-called exotic music or so-called tiki sounds. Arthur Lyman, Les Baxter, Esquivel Orchestra and so on. It's the Louis Theroux music. I love it. But whilst Esquivel was pumping this gorgeous stuff out, so Vacheslav Mascherin was seeing Esquivel's Space Age cocktail music and raising him. Look, Americans have uh, invented electronic guitar. Well, let's also invent something so we could 
tell that we are no worse than them. And of course they thought, okay, well, electronic balalaika sounds a little weird, so let's make an uh, electronic accordion. But due to ideological issues, he would never say that he was following American ideas. It all has been disguised as exotic music from faraway lands. It's this sort of thing that makes me think we can forget about Esquivel. The sounds Mascherin knocks out in Easy USSR Volume 2 are extraordinary. From another world, defying description, and whilst Mascherin is creating this with a shrug of his orchestra's shoulders, I think it's probably time we stop discussing Esquivel altogether and try to get to the bottom of what Mascherin's game was. Uh, there's been a whole period which started with the Soviets uh, launching the first uh, Sputnik in October 1957, when uh, there's been a real space race between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States of America. It was a race in technology. Above all, I think it was a race to be the representative of the future. And I heard that the cosmonauts enjoyed his music. Well, I'm afraid I know nothing about that. Hmm. It's disappointing. I think I've heaped too much expectation on the man who wrote the sleeve notes. I always do that. I'd read on Mescherin's wafer-thin Wikipedia page that his music had gone into space. It makes sense to me. There's something interstellar about it, for me. Listen. It's not from this planet, particularly. And the Wikipedia page was giving it tons about Gagarin being a fan. I guess that must be rumours. Rumours forming the bedrock of Mescherin's Wikipedia page. I need to verify this. I could really do with finding a cosmonaut. My sleeve notes man can only take me so far. Also, I need more music. Is there more music? All I've got is one meagre compact disc. There must be more. Well, I can tell you that he has recorded not hours, but probably days and weeks of music. I think I'd like you to go back into the archives, Archon. <laughs> well, I think it will be Just rather... Just for a week or two, uh -huh. you can find some more stuff for me. Okay, okay. Okay, team, uh, I can't promise you, but what I can promise is that I will address uh, your request to Oleg Nesterov, and, yes. and maybe he will come up with another reissue box. Oleg Nesterov, of course. His name was right there in the sleeve notes. We must track down Oleg Nesterov. Nesterov was the man who actually waddled around the archives, piecing together Easy USSR, Volume 2. Of course, my producer has his number. Oleg Nesterov. Our passport to the mother load. In the meantime, let's speak to another Russian she's unearthed. Don't include that into the interview, please. Do include Cut that. Do include that into the interview. <laughs> I'm a professional singer. This is not the best presentation. <laughs> Polina Shepard was a kid in the 1970s Soviet Union. Since my childhood, I've remembered many, many little tunes that were accompanying all sorts of shows on television, including a very famous Russian cartoon, which is like a Tom and Jerry cartoon, the wolf and the hare. Mm, and there was Volk, Zayt. Just you wait. And there was one tune that all children jumped to and we danced around listening to that tune. We used to play, singing it. So we all knew this music, we never knew who the author was. Well, yes. all people in, in yes. the Soviet Union or, or Russia had this... He just lurked in the corners. We didn't necessarily knew, know his name, but he was present in everyone's life, every day's life of every, I think, every single person in the Soviet Union. 
His music is positive. His music is energetic. It's slightly on the propaganda side, I would say. It's slightly on the side of, hey, people, we are so happy, it's all good. He has a piece called Siberian Melody. Siberian Melody or Siberian Fantasy. And it's a beautiful melodic piece. But I know that life in Siberia was difficult. My parents lived there. This one's the Siberian Melody. That's the one. I listened to it today. Now, how is that Siberian? <laughs> Cheery and with a certain breeziness, this music chimed with post style in Russia. But why the hell does it chime with me? And... So peaceful. Unacceptably peaceful. This is Deep Thought Dance. Underrated. By 2006, I was using them under my poetry. This one I would play under a poem about a goat. Others were used under sketches, on stage, in short films, fleeting television appearances. It was a crutch. Do you remember when I first foisted uh, the music of Mascherin upon you? Yeah, I do. Driving down to Devon, to Oakhampton, and you'd got this CD given to you by Peggy. Yeah. And you had no idea what it was, and we put it on. And I think we just sort of all started laughing. It was vital that this man got on board. I work a lot with Tom Basden, making short films, being one half of a sketch show, peddling a ramshackle double act. I fell in love with Mascherin's music and wanted him everywhere. This was the Yoko Ono moment. When you got married, was it was it in the frame at all for first dance or the um, or the bit where your wife came down the aisle? Was it ever in the shake up? It, weirdly, it wasn't. Mm. Mm. So but, you're sort of you've got quite a specific affection for it. Yeah, but I think if you I think if you play that if you play that song, then what the message you're sending out to people is um, I've got a ridiculous wife. <laughs> what you're about to experience <laughs> is ridiculous, <laughs> and I don't know if that's if that's the message you want at a wedding. When we've used it in comedy, do you think there is a sort of undermining that it brings to the table? I think there was a sort of a perfect marriage of styles because it's so silly, but it's not silly in a really kind of easy way. It's not childish in its silliness. It's um, still it's, quite dignified. It is, yeah, and it's really inventive in its silliness. You're making this documentary as someone who uh, who likes him. Well, that's the thing. I, sometimes I've thought, to what extent do I like him? I really enjoy it, but uh, there are times where I've questioned whether it's at all ironic, my adoration of Mesherin. That's the worry, isn't it? Hmm. Mesherin's band has been doomed because it has simply filled the gap in between the two first waves of, uh, of rock and roll music. Compared uh, to the sound of the Beatles and the Stones and the Kings and the Beach Boys, of course, Mesherin's music sounded absolutely outdated and uh, quite ridiculous. But you still have a place for it in your heart. Yes, yes, yes. I I still quite like this uh, this kinds of music. Like I'm a huge fan of an instrument called in Russian termen vox, and of course in English they say theremin. And I'm friends with most of the theremin uh, performers, including oh, yeah. including Lydia Kavina. She now lives in England. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm absolutely sure that you can find her. Lydia Kavina. Kavina is K-A-V-I-N-A. -A. If we are approaching the vertical antenna with our right hand, we are changing the pitch. Closer to the antenna, the pitch is higher. Uh, yep. Away from the antenna, it's... My producers found the thereminist in Oxfordshire in the end. 
But 30 years ago, she was touring the Easy USSR with Mascheron's orchestra. I'm changing the volume, so away from the antenna, the volume is louder. This girl has met Mascheron. He was her boss. There were electrical accordion, electrical violins, electrical mandolina. There was, of course, the vibraphone, just normal wave with uh, electrical mechanism in it. But also there were several types of um, Roland synthesizer, uh, mini Moog. Probably the only acoustical instrument was the drum set. And that was it. And everything else was uh, (laughs) sci-fi. That's right. But the theremin was one of the first instruments in the orchestra since uh, its very beginning. Well, I played with them actually until they finished. Yeah, until the 1989. Um, what was he like, Ms. Sharon? Did you, did you get on with him? Yeah, um, on one hand, he was a very warm-hearted person. On another hand, he was a very artistic person. He liked to show off. He liked to dance while uh, conducting the orchestra. He paid a lot of attention to how the performance looks. It was a big part of what is going on on stage. Where did you perform? So it was absolutely very different places. Uh, there were some very prominent places like Kalonnizar Doma Sayuzov. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful houses in Moscow. But also we visited uh, such stages as um, nuclear power station in Desnogorsk. This is the picture from uh, our tour uh, in the salt mine. Amazing. Uh, because we were performing for the workers of the salt mines in uh, Berezniki. And at some point we just went into the mines. <laughs> so this photo's got eight, well, what can only be described as miners. <laughs> but uh, that's we are, actually. We had to, uh, to be dressed as the oh, miners ourselves. They're not miners. That's, so no, it, that's Micherin himself. Oh, that's Micherin there on the left. Yeah, that's the, uh, <laughs> uh, the electro-violinist uh, Lebedev, Valentin Lebedev, uh, one of the oldest uh, musicians in the orchestra. I'm slightly less interested in the electro-violinist. The that's Micherin. He looks about 50 there. Dignified, smart, strong. Exactly what you'd expect from a fearless musical pioneer. And with wellies and a padded jacket. So what is, what is this photo? So in this photo we see uh, a couple of uh, musicians uh, of the orchestra, but also uh, several soloists. What else is in that photo? Uh, this is the rocket, actually. <laughs> oh yeah, there's just a huge rocket. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. so is that, is that in, in uh, Baikonur? Yes, it is in the Baikonur, yeah. Which is where they, the rockets, where the rockets flew into space. That's right. <laughs> There's that space thing again. I really need to find out if Mesherin's music ever did go into space. My producer needs to sort that side of things. For my money, she needs to spend less time falling in love with Mesherin's music and tapping her foot to it, and more time scouring Facebook for cosmonauts. Ah, track five, Bear Cub, Lush. I need more of this. For years, Ms. Sharon's music has laid under my so-called work and my so-called life like a crash mat. I've spent so long forcing the stuff down people's throats and jamming it into their ears that I've run out. There's not enough. I must replenish. There were the two albums, Volume 2 and then Volume 1. What would be your reaction if I said I could find more? Well, I'd I'd be really interested to listen to it, obviously. Can you find more? I'm trying to. This is Oleg Nesterov. By using a combination of wit, out-of-the-box thinking and email, my producer has tracked him down and hooked him in. Oleg Nesterov.
The man who put Easy USSR Volume 2 together. The man who might know where more can be harvested. Здравствуйте, Олег. Здравствуйте, Тим. Как дела? Прекрасно, прекрасно. Хорошо. Я не могу говорить по-русски. So here's the first question in English. Why did you compile Easy USSR Volume 2? Нет, это было самое, самое начало 2000-х, и uh, это все очень просто, когда... Uh, когда uh, It was in the early 2000s, we sort of entered into the world culture, and we had access to music from the rest of the world, and we started to uh, assess our own Soviet culture in perhaps a different way, looking back over what we had and seeing that, that Mishirin was really quite something unique. Начало существования ансамбля Мещерина... Мещерин's music appeared in Soviet life with the thaw in the Soviet Union after the death of Stalin and after the 20th Party Congress when all Stalin's criminal acts were exposed. And there was a, a feeling suddenly of more freedom around. Но и с другой стороны, из этой... There was a, a kind of change in, in the atmosphere with the end of the war. Mishirin's music uh, characterized this kind of light-heartedness that there was in society. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of problems, there are still problems, but let's not talk about them, let's be merry and light. And that kind of weightlessness was part of the spirit of that time. Да, сейчас это проявляется даже еще больше. He feels that kind of sense of lightness and carefreeness even more now when he listens to it. There was, there was a sense then of a, a sort of some kind of bright future. They don't have that feeling anymore. Хотя в те времена, безусловно, мещеринская музыка еще... The other aspect there is that Mishirin's music was a kind of secret weapon of Soviet propaganda. Uh, he had a friend whose mother worked in an arms factory in Perm, uh, where they made machine guns. There was a kind of radio booth which used to play out uh, Mishirin's music, so they'd be listening to this light-hearted music while they were putting together the, the weapons. If this is all that I could listen to, I think it, it would become quite sinister quite quickly. I thought you were going to say you'd be a happy man. <laughs> I'd be happy for a bit. I don't, you know, I would be happy for a bit. I think it would make me tense after a while. My producer has just handed me two things which have ignited feelings in me I previously had felt impossible in the realms of radio documentary making. Firstly, she has given me a WAV file. It's a new Mesherin track, as yet unheard by me. It is from Oleg Nesterov, and is entitled, quite enigmatically, Track 41. I can't believe my luck. Oh, and she's also found me a spaceman. I mean, I knew she was good, but this is very, very neat work. I'm going to wrap this documentary up with this new track, and I'm excited at the prospect. But first, let's nail this spaceman. Uh, здравствуйte. Do you remember hearing Mesherin's music? Ну вот здесь, чтобы вы понимали, что начало освоения. This is Alexei Leonov old-school Soviet cosmonaut and all-round legend. He was the first human being to ever do a spacewalk. And, amazingly, this man was also friends with Mashirin. My producer has found a Russian actor to speak the words of the cosmonaut in English, so some of the enormity of what we're hearing can be adequately conveyed. Space travel coincided with the emergence of electronic music, synthesized music. I used to invite Vyacheslav Mishirin to my house when I lived at the Chikolovsky Center for testing flight technology. We showed him our training rockets, he even sat in one. We sent music into space for pilots to listen to during long flights, including Mishirin's music. And by the time we flew to the space station, we had a cassette player with a big memory and recordings by the Mishirin's ensemble. 
it corresponded perfectly to the feeling you got of being on a space station in orbit. I floated freely and around me, enveloping me was Miss Sharon's music. No other kind of music goes so well with the feeling of weightlessness that a person has in space. There are ventilators that never stop running. And every ventilator produces a certain sound. And suddenly you start hearing Mesherin's music inside your head. Not the Scrabbing or a Prokofiev symphony, but electronic music as if it is written into the sound of the ventilators. Then you shake your head and all you hear is hum. Just a noise. So it's true. Mesherin's music is important in immeasurable ways. It has underscored thirst for knowledge even beyond our planet's frontiers. I knew I wasn't going mad when Peggy gave me the CD and I fell in love with it. Peggy gave me the first CD, Easy USSR Volume 2, nine years ago. Now my producer has tracked down some more. Of course she has, because she's Peggy. Peggy, the gift bearer out of the dinner party, became a radio producer two years afterwards. And it's Peggy who has navigated us through Mesherin's world. And it's Peggy who's now unearthed this. Let's see. A new track. Track 41. As yet unlistened to. By Mesherin. To underpin what is left of my life and work. I mean, I like it. Yes, <laughs> lovely. Tim Key's Easy USSR was presented by Tim Key, produced by Peggy Sutton, and is a Something Else production for BBC Radio 4. Now, harking back to the theremin, two things. One, I've always wanted to have a go on one, and two, if you go to the Radio 4 On Music section of our website, you'll be able to hear Bill Bailey telling the story of this remarkable hands-off electronic instrument and its enigmatic inventor, while charting its use from horror and sci-fi film soundtracks through to contemporary dance music and, of course, its use on the Beach Boys' iconic good vibrations. It's there, the story of the theremin on the website.